Hi, I'm Brian Kramer from briankramer.com, and you are listening to the Social Media Talks podcast with Alan Hennessy from compassmedia.ie. Welcome to Social Media Talks podcasts, brought to you by compassmedia.ie. Hello and thank you for joining me. This is the Social Media Talks podcast brought to you by compassmedia.ie, episode number 93. I'm your host, Alan Hennessy, and this is the podcast to help business owners who want to learn more about social media marketing. And if you'd like to listen to any of our previous podcasts, you can log on to our website at compassmedia.ie forward slash podcasts. And we are looking forward to today's show. Today I'm going to be joined by Brian Kramer. And Brian is a renowned business strategist, global keynote speaker, executive trainer and coach, and a two times best-selling author and Forbes contributor. As a former president and co-owner of Pure Matters, a Silicon Valley global marketing agency since 2001, he sparked the human-to-human, H2H movement that set out to humanize business through simpler communications, empathy, and celebrating our imperfections. His TED Talk is also subject in 2014 featured a TED First, allowing mobile devices during the event to share their experiences to illustrate his belief. He is the author of two books, There Is No B2B or B2C, It's Human to Human Connection, which rose to uh, number one in the business books on Amazon in the first week, and a second book, Shareology, now how sharing is powering the human economy, which made the USA Today top 150 book list um, the week that it was released, as well as a number one Amazon business book as well. He has voted the top three taught leadership speakers you do not want to miss by Forbes magazine. He is on the top 25 keynote speakers you need to know in Inc. magazine and global top 50 social CEOs on Twitter from the Huffington Post as well. And today we're going to be talking to Brian all about building human to human approach through digital marketing. So I'm looking forward to this conversation and hopefully you are too. So without further ado, I think we will transition straight over to the interview with Brian. Hi, Brian. How are you? Thanks for joining us today on the Social Media Talks podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have your company. Uh, we've been uh, trying to connect for a good few weeks now, trying to get this organized. So uh, I'm delighted you're eventually here. So how are you today? I'm doing so wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And I do know that we uh, we switched back and forth a few times, but I'm glad we finally made it here. Brilliant stuff. And of course, uh, today we're going to be talking all about, uh, I suppose it's uh, learn, uh, I'm learning to to speak market and also uh, sell human so it's, it's it's your hashtag it's the h2h so i'm really interested in uh, learning a lot more about this and i'm sure it's going to be just a fascinating subject as well to talk about but before we get started uh, maybe you might give us a little bit of a brief introduction about yourself uh, before we get stuck into our chosen topic today yeah no problem my name is brian kramer as you mentioned and i am my uh, performance business coach full-time speaker and author, as you mentioned before, of uh, of the first book, There's No B2B or B2C, it's HH, Human to Human, and then my second book, Shareology, How Sharing Powers the Human Economy. Brilliant. And uh, of course, we'll talk about that as well. Um, it's it's. I think it's a fascinating subject. Like, I've been following you along for a good while now on um, social media and also, of course, all of the different platforms as well and watching your uh, speeches. I've yet to see you in uh, in, in Ireland, but I'm sure we will get to see you speak here uh, one day soon, and uh, I'll be definitely in the front row for that. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But I think um, we're talking here about um, H to H, human to human, and the whole idea of marketing and that 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 respect. And I and I find it fascinating, like from what some of the things that you've said and the way you've talked about it on on your different um, videos and stuff like that, and in your conferences. So. Um, Maybe you might explain a little bit in more detail to the audience uh, what actually H2H is as opposed to B2B and B2C type of thing, selling. Yeah, sure. Um, well, everybody knows uh, that there are two different types, or if you don't know, then um, maybe this will help kind of set the stage. 
that there's two different types of businesses um, in general. There's businesses that are selling to other businesses, and there's businesses that are selling to uh, to directly to the consumer, to you and me. And um, and so the 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 challenge, as I saw it when that first uh, came up, when I first started talking about it, now almost about 15 to 20 years ago, it was that no matter what, we're all the same. Uh, we're we're selling to humans. Uh, we're selling to to somebody, to a person. Uh, to to a person that's that's multidimensional has feelings and emotions and and we we all respond to di- to things in 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 different ways because we're multidimensional. Now, when you look at business to business and business to consumer, um, you start to think about if you think about it in those terms, you're, you think you know we're still all selling to people, and so that's where human to human comes in. Um, we really are uh, buying from each other, not not from a company. You can't sell a company; you can only sell another person. Uh, so that's where H H was born. Uh, when I was first actually took off was about five years ago. I think it was t- uh, 2014 when. And I was on stage and I was talking about, and I had that slide up on stage when it took off. It was, it was just something that ended up, um, you know, going viral over the people took their cameras and took pictures. And over the next 24 to 48 hours, it got over 120, 20 million impressions and uh, went up, went on Instagram and Twitter. And I quickly realized that everything that I've been talking about had now become something that was more relevant to, uh, to everyone because social media social media was just now at that time uh taking off and because it it became so uh important that uh social media now leveled the playing field social media allowed for anyone to talk to anyone where before a business could not um not necessarily talk to the consumer there was no there's no methodology no way for uh for a consumer to have a response back and for a business to have a mm. response back. And so social media opened up the doors and, the, and, and essentially created this whole new genre of communication that allowed everyone to have an opinion. Um, now that can also hurt a, a business as well if you're leaving a public review or you're leaving a public statement or whatever. And so now it be, now it creates and puts the power of the voice of the consumer, you know, forefront. So all of that really was where people saw HH or human to human as as a powerful um, channel, uh, powerful uh, platform. And now that it is four years later, it's actually become something entirely, uh, not entirely, but mostly different um, because now we're looking at, at artificial intelligence and augmented reality mm. and virtual reality and, and, and all of these different technologies that, that's really driving like automation. It's driving all of us uh, farther away from each other. Um, we're automating more and more and more, and yet this still the the most important thing is 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 a human to human connection because the farther away we get, the more disconnected we are, the less likely we are to stay strong as a con- customer. Mm-hmm. Um, the strongest, deepest customer relationships are the ones where you have a relationship. And so when you buy from someone else, they're less likely to be a fickle customer and, and go off somewhere else and be, uh, you know, and, and change your mind about which brand you're going to be dedicated to. Mm. Um, if you drive a deeper relationship and you build on this HGH methodology in your sales and your marketing and your HR and your, in your product development, everything ar- around it becomes around the customer and how do we communicate with them? That really drives a much deeper relationship at the end of the day so mm. that they're not going to be as fickle. Uh, so the, the problem challenge four years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago has all changed, but it's always come back to one thing and that's connection connection between two people or more. Mm. And if we continue to drive towards connection, um, it's becoming harder and harder to do. And so that's why I think it's going to be an an interesting time over the next five to 10 years. But the more that we can drive to connection, the more that we can actually uh, sustain and build and grow our businesses. Yeah. And I think it's so, I think it's so important, as you say, with the age of, you know, the digital, the digital age that we live in now, whether it be on social media or whether it be, you know, as, as you say, AI, I think it is so important because I think when we look back at everything and we look back at business in, in in every shape and form you know people buy from people as you say there and it's it's about building them connections and it's about also remembering that there there is people I like I've a I've a 
a graphic that I put out every so often is, isn't this is, you know, there is someone at the other end of that computer. So, and I think it's, you know, it's so true. And I think we miss that. You know, there's, there's a lot of times when you see people, when you see businesses online and they're just pushing out content. All right, it's, it is relevant to what they're saying, but it's not talking to me or you. It's just saying, well, as a mass, there you go. Whereas if you actually get a person on the phone and you ring, like I've often rang up a company and they'll say, you know, oh, dial one for this, dial two for that. And then you, then you eventually get a person. But it's when you get that actual person that the conversation starts and they understand you. And now you have, I think, that human connection. I think that's so, so important um, to have. Uh, in this day and age, definitely because of, I suppose, we, everything has become so much on demand now that we're we're sort of losing the sight of that person to person connection or that human to human connection. Absolutely, um, losing the connection is uh, is the hardest part. Mm. So um, that's where I think that technology and humans can work together. So uh, you look at tech. So a lot of companies are looking at technology is how can I build that technology so I don't have to have a conversation? And that's not what we should be looking at. We should be looking at how can technology move me closer and faster to a to, conversation. Yeah. And once you start to think about it that way, then it starts to make more sense where it's technology and humans working together, not technology versus humans. Mm. And I think that's very true because I think that, you know, if we, ta- if we take that, I suppose that that idea and we, and we develop that as well as that everything else becomes so much more simpler because we now are all focusing on the one thing we're all focusing on connections and building them connections so yeah I see the, I see the points of that uh, I think it's you know it's it's it's, it's it's probably the simplest thing to you know we 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 can do, but we we just seem to forget about it all the time. We just sort of we get overloaded with ever with all the other bits and pieces that that we we forget about this. It is forgotten, and it's easy to forget because we all want to cocoon. Um, it, Faith Popcorn wrote a great book in 1984, and she she predicted. Um, she's an analyst and, and she pred- uh, the fu- for future and she predicted that in 1994 uh, and then well into the 2000s that we would start to cocoon ourselves. We'd start to uh, cocooning, meaning we would stay, we'd have no desire, mm-hmm. no, no requirement to, to move our bodies outside because we could work remote. Um, all of our groceries could eventually become delivered to us. We have Amazon Prime. All of our, uh, our, all of our things could be uh, same day delivery. Um, all of our work could be done over things like Zoom or WebEx. All of our uh, communication would live on digital or text messaging. And here we are in 2020, and all of it is true. We have this uh, this uh, place that we all uh, can live, work, and play, and it's all within the boundaries of our own homes. And and if you do travel to work, you know it's really still even cocooned into you know your work and your your home and so we're starting to develop these habits that are much different than where we've been before and so i think it's really important that we identify that and design um ways for us to be more human and get outside and get outside of our comfort zones and the one number one thing the reason that we all um glom glom on to social media specifically is because of that connection and which relates directly into community everyone wants community Mm -hmm. nobody doesn't want to belong to something bigger than themselves and so if we can create something that's bigger than ourselves in a physical form in the form of a community within our own backyards then we won't be losing or getting out of touch with with what what it is you're talking about yeah and i i I would agree with that you know like when we look at especially even community say we look at social media for instance and we look at you know the way there's so many groups and stuff like that and we know that you know certain one certain social media platforms are now pushing to say you know we we want to concentrate more on groups and stuff like that and i can understand that and i think that being in a group like we have a group that's i'm in i'm in and on linkedin and what we do is is every month or so we actually meet up even though we're all online we still meet in a physical place and connect because we know each other a lot better and i remember going to the first one and like because i'd known these people that have been online for a good few years but i'd never actually met them i just sort of talked to them online but when i actually got in front of them it was a total different experience because we were a lot more relaxed but we knew each other and it just 
it just gelled and I just see the the whole point of it. And I think that's, I suppose, in a sense, in an essence is what you're talking about really there is, is actually connecting as much as we do it online. Um, I remember being, Ted Rubin said once that, you know, if you start a conversation online, take it offline, but then take it back online so you always remember that the next time that you talk to that person physically, that you'll know what's going on and it's also keeping you connected with other people. And I think it's it's really is. It's it's very true. That's a great point and I love me some Ted Rubin. So uh, uh, he, he always, uh, his R and R and my HH are uh, like like brothers. So that um, initially like joined at the hip nearly at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, he was actually the person that was at that uh, keynote that I mm. gave, um, where it where it went viral, and he was the MC, and he asked me to go back a slide. And when that when I brought back up the HH slide, he's the one that instigated uh, taking the picture when wow. the audience took the picture. So uh, he was the person who was, who helped to bring the audience into the mm. into the idea um, as this thing took off. So I you know I love me like I said I love Ted Rubin for. For all men, all kinds of reasons. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of that. Yeah, and like I had the pleasure of meeting him here at the one of the conferences that he done here in Dublin, and like that, I was uh, I would have followed him. And when we met at the conference, it was like I was like a spoiled child. Like I said, "There's Ted Rubin's type of thing." And when I turned around and I said, "Can I have a photograph?" and he just went, "Yeah, sure." And we ended up hanging out for the nearly for the whole conference throughout the day. You know, now not just me alone, but like, there was a couple of us. But like as he had advocates it is you know return and relationship and it's about connecting and i think that's very similar to what you're saying here as well so i think it's so you know it's it really is it's it's a visionary thing that we we look at it but we're not actually sort of going right it's only when like the types of yourself talk about it and help us understand it i think it becomes a lot more clearer of what we have to do and then as you like i know there's a there's another part of one of the conferences that you talked about was uh the shareable experiences and we connect and we share and i think that that was very very it, it struck a chord with me with having those shareable experiences online and offline yeah shareable experiences are um not utilized enough mm. uh in my opinion we we uh or they're utilized too much so it it, it can go one of two ways you can overshare for sure or you can um, but as a brand, you can create shareable experiences, kind of like um, if you remember the Kodak moment where mm. people get into a space and a time and the brand can create, I think, what's called, you know, what, what we're calling now a shareable moment. For instance, um, you know, if you're in an Uber or a Lyft, I don't see too many shareable moments that they've created as a brand, <laughs> um, which which could be, um, and that's not a, not to say anything negative about the brands, but um, but there's not a, a, a maybe a feature inside the app where you could take a picture with your driver and, and after a good experience and actually mm -hmm. share it out on on social, um, you know, after you've had a good experience. So you know, there's there's so many different wonderful moments in life um, that happen whether you want to call it personal you've just uh, had had a shareable experience a co-created shareable experience with your family and friends or or at work where um where you're 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 enjoying you know everybody's company or time uh, together perhaps at at a happy hour and and everyone's having a good time and maybe that's a shareable experience just to let everybody in on what is it like to to work at a place what's it what's going on um in the environment and how how is it you know, how is the, if I were to work for your company, what would that look like? I don't always want to hear about um, just the uh, next marketing trend or the next um, technology advice or whatever. I also want to connect with them, with companies on a more human level, because the more that we the more that we share as people, um, the more people uh, start to understand us yeah. and that starts to grow our personal brands. Well, the same thing is true on our business brand. Um, and so if you start to look at a company like a person and say, how can we share and create shareable experiences and make it okay to share those experiences out, I think people will connect more and, and feel more obliged to stay loyal and true because, um, because they feel 
like there's so much more emotion and they, they're feeling like they are connected back into the brand. Yeah, and I see, you know, like I sort of what springs to mind there when you're talking about that is, is the types of, say, you know, where you see behind the scenes and, you know, in these different companies and you saw, like I've seen in a number of restaurants where they do behind the scenes and there's even, I we were working with a brand uh, oh, a couple of months back and they were a dentist and the, the dentist was doing all crazy type of stuff but he was having like you know like on say for instance our instagram page he would put up stories of where he would you know give make it you know receptionist to be sitting at the reception and they he he jump out in there and stuff like that but it was behind the scenes and it really made it a lot more personal so when you did walk in you didn't feel as I suppose as intimidated as as anything when you go to a dentist you know it was a lot more shareable that type of content and it worked and it was having massive results for them so and like you look at the types of say even Google where they you know they have that relaxed atmosphere the way the way the way they want to project what they do and how they do it and stuff like that so you can see it with a lot of major corporations that do that and i think it's up to i suppose the small and the medium sized businesses to start thinking about that and they do to a certain extent on social media because they have the ability and i think they they know that they can do it there but i think it's about moving it you know moving it on to the next step of actually creating something even bigger than that again mm, um you know you want to call it rinse and repeat right but mm. it's not um that's we're also dealing with people here and um and it starts you know uh, some of this starts to migrate or the conversation we're having is starting to migrate into how do you turn relationships into uh potentially influencers and how can they potentially influence your business because of their the power of the voice and the word, word of mouth marketing, which still exists, maybe even on a bigger level than it ever has. Um, but when you take a person that that uh, truly believes in you and they want to share their experience out and um, and and they don't typically, um, I break down in shareology six different. Uh, types of sharing and and I actually have a, a an assessment people can take your audience can take if if you want I can share the link with you Brilliant, yeah. but uh, one of those profiles is um, called the selective and the selective is a person who actually doesn't share a lot they are very meticulous about what they share uh, they they don't have a propensity to you know tweet and Facebook post and LinkedIn every day they're more selective with what they share and with who they share hmm. and so when you get a selective that is sharing something because they're really bought into it, people tend to listen to them more than any other any other personality, any other sharing type. So, um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. And I and I did I did this whole um, what we're talking about here. I did on my TED talk. I actually um, in the audience we had everybody have a phone, a cell phone, which was never allowed in the TED audience before but at this one thing that we did they, they allowed us to bring it in and we had everybody share what um what inspired them so it was hashtag sharing inspires and we said now we want you to tweet out what inspires you or what you want to do to inspire the world and we wanted to do this as a test from the ted stage to see if we could tap into the power community make a connection and inspire the world and that's it that was the whole that was the whole concept and so um we did that we came back up and at the end of the day it ended up being like 120 million in impressions which was cool but the other the be the best part was that um that we had um the analytics at the time to be able to spot about 50 to 100 people all all around the world that not weren't sitting inside of the theater mm -hmm. when i was giving the ted talk it was they were influencers of the of this idea this concept of sharing inspires and yeah. they started sharing and as soon as they started sharing other people climbed uh, glommed onto it and started sharing based upon them. So what we learned from that is that if you just have 50 to 100 in this case, and sometimes it can be five or 10 people that are that are super into your product or service, and, and you want to go either viral or you want to make a difference in, in, in or an impact, you don't really need that many people. What you do need is just people who truly believe in your product mm. and to make a connection with them, a deep connection. And then, and then if they feel like it's right and they're willing to share, you can do almost anything. It's, it's unbelievable what you can do with, with that kind of power. 
Wow, and uh, yeah, I've seen. I have watched that TED talk, and it is, it's, it's definitely one to uh, if you haven't seen it. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well for people to to go and watch that as well because it is. It's it was truly amazing what you did there, and you know, I, I just see the, the that whole like that whole concept of as you say of just having a small community that are willing to you know that that get behind you. Like I know, for instance, when when I started out. My whole ethos was that when we were dealing with customers or if we were dealing with students, that we would be personal with them. We would actually connect with them before we actually taught them anything. So the whole idea was is, is that it was a personal connection. And when we got that personal connection, and that's what I've basically built the brand on, is, is that personal connection. Because I feel it's so, so important to have that because I think when you have that, it brings so much value to what you're doing. And it also, it, it instills in yourself a feeling of goodwill and you also feel good about yourself, which has to benefit you in the in bigger scheme of it. Oh, so, so well said. So well said. I don't, I don't know if I can add anything <laughs> to it. It's, that's exactly right. Yeah, and I yeah it is, and like I know you um you spoke about, and it was and it's so I'm just sort of digressing here in my own head as much as anything else, and I suppose I should be putting it out there is is that we I was actually doing a conference at the weekend where we were talking about having the perfect piece of content to go out, and I'm always saying that no, you don't have to have the perfect because there is no such thing as perfection because we will always strive for more which will never, we never think that is perfect. And you talk about embracing imperfection, which I found very interesting. So uh, you might speak about that a bit. Yeah, that's one of the uh, three HH pillars, Mm. simplicity, imperfection, and empathy. And um, uh, with those those three pillars, if you embrace all three uh, as a company, then you will be, uh, you'll be most likely to be creating more deeper uh, connection and uh, it will mirror that of the closest thing to a human Um, because, uh, and this this is kind of, this kind of, I think it's fascinating and also interesting that as humans, we have some very large differences between what um, robots and AI and machine learning could ever be, um, which is those three imperfection. um, Imperfection is, when something, it, it, well, there's a lot of ways that we can come at it, but uh, one of the most um, prominent ones is is when something goes wrong. Um, when when something bad happens, mm-hmm. um, brands have had that happen all the time. When something bad happens, like um, you know, especially like you think of a pharmaceutical company, when something happened when, uh, to a drug and people were affected by it, there are thousands of possibilities of things going wrong and do go wrong every day. Uh, my favorite thing is is like just to think of is Gaylord Fokker from the parent uh, yeah. um, from Meet the Parents. Um, it, you know, if you think about that movie, and and if you haven't seen that movie, run, don't walk to see it because my favorite movie on earth. Because everybody um, uh, in that movie realized that that he was probably the most imperfectly perfect mm. human being. Um, he would if if something uh, would go wrong, it it would happen to him. Um, you know, and, and that's what that whole movie was about was how he, uh, he dealt with it and, uh, you know, in a humorous way, I think it was, um, uh, Ben Stiller who played the, the character. That's right. That yeah. And, and, um, and he's one of my favorite actors for that reason. Cause he just, you know, it's such a humorous way of how he embraced imperfection. Mm. I mean, who, who he lost the cat, stole a different cat, <laughs> uh, that's true. painted the, painted the cat's tail and then, and then, and then pretended it was the cat brought it home and then they all figured out that it wasn't really the cat. And, and he, you know, he was just trying to to be a good guy and, and find their Mm. cat for them and make everybody happy. But, you know, imperfect human being, he also lit the roof with a cigarette, cigarette he was smoking and burned the whole wedding down and, and, um, and all this work. And, and yet all he was, was just wanting a cigarette. So he could get away from everybody and just have a Mm. moment because it was such, such chaos. So, I mean, there's all these different wonderful things, but when you think about it, um, you know, these kinds of things uh, happen, not that you burn a roof off or you spray paint a cat's no, but tail, but, saying, you know, yeah. but there are all these different things that happen in businesses and our lives that are um, perfectly imperfect. And when you embrace it, then you have a much better chance of connecting to your audience. When you try to hide it or you try to 
make it look perfect, um, it, it will, will never, never, ever go right. Um, it, it'll, it'll never sit well with the audience. So that's what the imperfection side is all about. Mm. And I love the, I love the, um, the, when you're doing your, one of your talks there where you talked about KFC and the way they ran out of chicken and they just came straight out and they, uh, they just said, yes, look, we've run out of chicken. And there was all the, the whole story behind it of saying like, you know, owning up and saying, right, well, we're not perfect. We don't we don't have this perfection that we have. And so I, I, I see, you know, I, I thought that was a very interesting story, the way that was told as well. Well, thank you so much. I, I think that, you know, when, when you, when you look at, when you look at imperfection um, and then you start to, you start to look at uh, the other two areas and make sure that you're not only just focused on imperfection, you're also looking at your brand mm. and yourself, um, whichever one you want to apply this to, that you are, because as humans, we tend to be complex. We, we don't, we, we make things complex. We, we almost too complex. We like when we see something and we have to get a lot of things done in our day, or we need to do a lot of things as a team to get get a project out the door, get a campaign out the door, or um, build our business, or make a million dollars, or whatever. We're all making it complex, and that's what we tend to do. And when we start to bite off things and really simplify it down into little um, Lego blocks, little pieces that can start to just build the build the platform until build the the uh, um, the right things put the right things in place until we get to the top of what we're trying to do, which is which is get to the top of this mountain, right? Mm. Um, we're all trying to succeed in a in a way that um, we're, we could be proud of. The problem is that sometimes we don't even know what the mountaintop is. Yeah. Um, or we get to the mountaintop and we look out and there's a higher mountaintop in the distance and we're like, I gotta get that one next. So there's always a mountaintop to go, mm. go to. So why and and because of this, because of our human nature. Of, of make of seeing things and making it too complex then we also tend to show that it comes up in our marketing and our messaging and our and our verbiage and and everything that we do so um unlearning what we've done in making things complex and really simplifying the way that we approach it and then looking at it and saying okay now how can i describe this so that it is simple for somebody else to understand yeah. is um is is how humans and why we react to things and things work much better. So when you think about campaigns or you think about things in your life that you you uh, glon, you you really were attracted to, it's probably because it was much simpler to understand mm. and it and it really made sense to you. And the last one is um, empathy. Uh, robots can't have empathy. Um, it's one of my fa- it's one of my favorite one of my favorite subjects is is empathy. I just think it's because I think there's so much to empathy that people miss out on and and it's what attracts humans to humans yeah. because we we're hearing we're listening we we understand and when you are hearing and listening and fully present and understanding another human being uh there's nothing there's nothing greater in a relationship and going in in deepening a relationship than empathy mm. and uh and it is it is impossible um and i'll put the stake in the ground and say it is impossible for um, for machines to have empathy for humans, it is machi- it is impossible. So that's going to be our greatest um, competitive mm. uh, advantage. And I'll, and I'll say this, uh, and and kind of close out on this little thing that we're talking about, which is that being because of that, because we have this empathy as our superpower, um, being human actually is our competitive advantage. Mm. It's, so it's, if we are able to embrace simplicity, empathy, and imperfection, then being human is our competitive advantage to everything else that's out there. Yeah, and it's really as, it really is as simple as that when we think about it. And I know there's a lot of elements to it, and I understand that, and I understand even what you're saying about simplicity, because I, I, I've, a, I've, a, I've studied NLP and stuff like that, so I know sort of looking at the way when people think that they, they make these, you know, this the saying like we you know, we're making mountains out of molehills. When an actual fact, if we look at the big picture and start to chunk it down, it becomes so much easier for us to understand it, and then we build from there. And I think, you know, that's that really is, as you say, if we have these three elements, 
we are we will never be overtaken by a machine i suppose that, that, that a simple fact of it really isn't it really yeah and uh it well it's up to us to define what mm. what machines do and so that's that's a whole another conversation that we could have but um there's a there's a difference in um right now there, there's a difference that we can make in what we do to design machines to do mm. um there isn't really truly artificial intelligence right now right now it's it's machine learning um machine learning is a, a sequence of events that happens because we programmed it to mm. do that and it learns it a machine learning learns so if it does something that doesn't make sense it'll learn to do something a little bit better mm. but it's defined by a rule set that we give it so it can't go any further um for for example uh there's a uh, uh there's a bunch of pro- software out there that will schedule your uh your meetings for you um there's one in particular called uh x.ai and that's the website x.ai and i don't work with them but i, I i've used them in the past um, and the, you can use either Amy or Andrew, that's the artificial intelligence bots, mm-hmm. um, robots. And basically what you do, if you were to reach out to me, um, and say, Hey, Brian, can we do a podcast together? I could copy Amy and say, Hey, Amy, work with, work with this, uh, nice man, uh, Alan, and please get me, get him and he and I on a, on a, a meeting together and she'll reach out to you immediately. Now, no human can get is Mm. is 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 available immediately at i mean if i were to email you at two in the morning and amy answers you back right away you you'd be thinking oh my god what does brian pay his assistant (laughs) um she's there right right on the spot 24 hours a day (laughs) what is he doing so you know and then all of a sudden she says hey alan uh here are some uh times that brian's available or you can click this link and just schedule directly on his schedule and and if you reply and you say hey yeah that that sounds good i can do this date she sends you immediately again Hmm. a uh an invite to a schedule with a link and and or a place to meet for coffee or a place to do whatever um and so or have lunch or whatever and so um there's there the reason i tell you that is because one we can automate certain things that are repetitive every day Hmm. and we're going to start to do that more and more and more which will replace certain skill sets but also it's going to help us. And what this does is at the end of the day, what it's helping us to do is for you and I to have a conversation together, Mm. right? So there's still a human to human interaction. It's just taking away the monotonous uh, thing that that we all have a hard time with, which is getting, I mean, and you and I, we know this, right? Like Mm. how many times did you and I try to do this podcast? And, and so, so, so Amy and, and Andrew can really make that, make that pain, that headache go away. And it's helping us to arrive to a human to human conversation. Um, so the, the light and the darkness of it is this, the lightness side is that it's helping us. Technology is aiding us to do things so that we can, we can become closer and deepen our relationships. Mm. Now, the minute that it goes over into the dark side is when it actually has the conversation for you mm. and, or it can talk and have a, um, it has its own, um, develops its own language or it develops its own uh, thinking and it can do things that it doesn't need us for. Um, um, and, and so we don't need to go into the whole dark side cause it, it gets too scary. And I just like to stay away from that, mm. but, um, but we control that. And so we're, those are the kinds of conversations that are happening at AI conferences. Like what are, what do we want to design so that we can still use technology to build it on the lightness side and how do we define it so it does this one thing so in this case technology only allows the system amy and andrew to schedule appointments and that's all it's going to do and it won't go any farther than that and we're going to stay on the light side mm. and i think that's that's where that's where technology has helped us in so many ways that we that we have now got this ability to do this and we have these aids to help us to do you know i suppose as well as much as only as we're we're more we can be more efficient in what we're doing and how we're doing it and it gives us that extra time to actually when we do get to have the talk that we haven't gone through a huge rigmarole of trying to get to that stage it has shortened that i suppose the distance in that for us to get to where we want to be and then, as you say, it gives us more time to sit and to talk and do that 
human to human connection. Yeah, it is. And I could sit here and talk about this all day because I just find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, but before I finish, uh, we finish up here today, Brian, I ask my guests uh, one simple question at the end of every podcast. And it's not related to anything that we've been talking about. And that question I put to you is if you had the chance to invite someone to dinner, whether it be past or present, who would it be? And why? Uh, one of my favorite, um, I, that would be hard because you're asking me for one. Well, you can have a number I, of them. And you I, can have a number of them if you want. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with two people uh, then since I can have a number. And I'm going to say, um, actually, I'm going to go with three. Uh, the first person I'm going to say is Brene Brown. I'm a massive fan of hers. I think she, mm. her, her work in, in empathy and, um, and uh, openness is fantastic uh, vulnerability and just the work that she's doing to to help humans be better humans and more open uh, humans I think it's just incredible so mm. that's one number two is I would say Malcolm Gladwell I like the way that he thinks I like how he takes a regular everyday thing and he tur- he turns it on its side and says uh, it shows how how we can take something and rethink it re re um, idealize about mm. it and and maybe look at it a different way uh, than how we've always been looking at it it's it's really fascinating how he he takes each book that he writes and and he he looks at something that we've all mm. been looking at every day and then he just says well what if it was this and you go ah oh, yeah yeah <laughs> it's the penny yeah That's i know true. That I've, I've had you them know? yeah that aha and moment so, that, what really mm, yeah <laughs> yeah so that's this that's number two Number three, it might be a little more um, of an answer. I think you'll you probably have heard uh, more often, but I I love her just the same, and that's Oprah. Mm. I, I think Oprah just she's what she's done to bring um, you know a different level of of uh, spiritualism and and um, and and consciousness into the world and made it made it more mainstream mm. has been has been really really great it's it's helped everybody to i think see a, a whole new level of what's acceptable and and as we all evolve and we start to see ways that we can start to think and do and be with other people in different ways i think it's it helps to to um, have people like that leading us and and doing that having that way of thinking so i i would love to sit down with her and have have a chat and or mm. a meal like you said and uh, a dinner and and just talk with her about um her thoughts over that what what she's what what got her going what where she sees she where she's at and where she's heading mm. and three fabulous and three incredible people there yes and definitely and well if you are having dinner with any of them please do give me a call because I will definitely come along to that as well because I'd be interested to sit in on them as well. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Brian, how can people reach out and connect with you if they want to talk with you uh, a little bit more? Yeah, no problem. It, it's really, I made it really simple. So if you go to anywhere online, Brian Kramer, Brian with a Y and Kramer with a K, uh, you can go to briankramer.com or on Twitter at Brian Kramer. In fact, you uh, you can go to uh, Facebook at forward slash Brian Kramer or LinkedIn forward slash Brian Kramer. Um, and, uh, and and the, the uh, if you want to know your, per- your sharing type, which type of personal brand you are, we were talking about that before, mm. um, then you can go to briankramer.com forward slash personal brand quiz and it will allow you within about 30 to 45 seconds you'll know uh which sharing which of the six sharing types you are that's based upon a new york times um report and then i turned it into an algorithm and now it helps you to understand that and not only that it'll 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 actually tell you there's a there's some more information there to to tell you exactly now that you know your type what are you going to do with that and how do you learn and grow from that so there's all kinds of good things there Great stuff, and um, we'll uh, we of course we'll put um, links to all of the all of your uh, social media links and all your w- w- website, and uh, also the personal brand um, in the um, in our show notes for the, for this particular podcast. Brian, it has been an absolute pleasure to uh, sit and talk with you today. Eventually, we got to we got to record this podcast, and it has been a. Uh, well worth the wait. Uh, so once again, thanks so much for taking the time out uh, to come and chat with us today on the Social Media Talk Show. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate you. Brilliant stuff. And uh, we shall talk to you very soon. So have a great day and thank you again. Awesome. Awesome. 
Hey, thanks for joining us today on the Social Media Talks podcast, and hopefully you learn some great information and also insights from our guests today. And if you'd like to listen to any of our previous podcasts, you can log on to our website at compassmedia.ie forward slash podcasts. And all of our podcasts are available on all the usual podcast providers. And we would be delighted if you would leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, as we are always thrilled to receive your feedback on any of the programs. You can also subscribe to the podcast there so you never miss an episode as well. And if you'd like the show notes for this episode or for any of the previous episodes, please log on to our website at compassmedia.ie forward slash show notes. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, please do get in contact with us. All you have to do is email us at smtalks at compassmedia.ie. And if you'd like to find out more about the services that Compass Media provide, from social media marketing and training to podcast services, please visit our website for more details. You can also reach out and connect with me across all of the social networks, including Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and I will personally answer every one of your requests. That's about all for today. I've been Alan Hennessy from Compass Media for the Social Media Talks podcast. And we look forward to talking to you next week. And as I always say, be social. So until next week at the same time, bye-bye. Social Media Talks podcast is a production from compassmedia.ie. The Social Media Talks podcast is sponsored by Content Cal. For more information, visit their website at contentcal.io. We would also like to remind you the Social Media Talks podcast is proudly supported by charityradio.ie.